All right, if you take your Bibles tonight and go with me to Proverbs chapter number 28, please. Proverbs chapter number 28, and then also, if you will find uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 9. Proverbs 28 will just kind of be a verse to kind of get us rolling, get us uh, started tonight. Uh, for the next several weeks, uh, I'm going to be preaching on different aspects of King's, uh, King David's life. Uh, I'm not going to really take them chronologi chronologically, uh, just different aspects. And so tonight is going to be uh, the first message on that. Last week we finished up uh, First Peter, and so for the next several weeks uh, it will be King David. Proverbs chapter number 28 and verse number 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall, now what's that next word? Not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, if you'd go with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 9, we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight. I hope you, that you, I hope you, you have a Bible uh, and can read along with me because you'll get so much more out of the message uh, uh, tonight. But I've just entitled my message tonight, Why Was King David a Success and King Saul a Failure? When Mike Colin was a linebacker for the Dolphins and a graduate of Auburn University, his former college coach, Shug Jordan, asked him if he would do some recruiting for him. Mike said, sure, coach. And then he asked him, what kind of player are we looking for? The coach said, well, Mike, you know there's a fellow that you knock down and he stays down. Mike said, we don't want that kind of player, do we? And the coach said, right. And then the coach said, you know, there's a fellow, you knock him down, and he gets up, and you knock him down again, and he stays down. Mike said, boy, we don't want that kind of player, do we, coach? And the coach said, you're right. And then the coach said, you know, Mike, there's this player, you knock down, and he gets up. And you knock him down, and he gets up again, and you knock him down, and he gets up again, and you knock him down, and he gets up again. And Mike said, that's the player we want, isn't it, coach? And the coach said, no, we want the guy that's doing all the knocking down. If I were to ask you tonight, who wants to be successful? Everybody would want to be successful. I don't know anybody that gets up in the morning time and says, you know, I, I think I want to be a failure. I don't think I want to be happy. I don't think I want to be moving spiritually towards Christ. But many times that happens. Kevin Geary states this. He says, success happens not by chance, but by because you were giving a chance and you took advantage of it. Aaron Falconer said, There will always be those who sit around waiting for success to find them. I have known a lot of people in my life like that. They just sit around and they're just waiting for success to come to them, but it never comes. There will be those who are simply not willing to achieve it. Earl Angela Duckworth writes, She says, Reaching success is about stamina over months and years, not talents or high IQ. You see, some of you may be like me. I don't have a lot of talent in the world. I've wanted to work hard for the things that I've gotten. I, I'm not the smartest guy. There's, just a, there's tons of people in here tonight that are a hundred times smarter than I. Sometimes I, I can't grasp certain uh, subjects. You know, I've told you my second grade teacher told my mother that, that I would never amount to anything because I wasn't smart enough. But you know, one of the things that we can do is get into the Word of God and find out what God says is success. And what God is going to say brings success into one's life has nothing to do with your IQ, has nothing to do with your talents or abilities. And I think as we look at King Saul and King David's life, I think we're going to find the secret to that. And I think the secret is given to us in Proverbs 28 that says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Or he that covereth his sins will be a failure, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In 1 Samuel chapter number 9, we know that the nation of Israel, they wanted a king. They wanted to be like the other nations around them that had a king. And, and when they went into war and when they went into battle, they, they wanted a king to lead them. And we know that God told Saul, you, you go tell the people, or Samuel, you go tell the people, hey, if they have a king, it's going to cost them something. They said, we don't care. We want a king. 
And so in chapter number 9, they are going to begin searching for this king. And verse number 1 says, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekroth, the son of Apheth, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. That, that also means a man of character, high character. Well, he had a son in verse number 2 whose name was Saul. He was a choice young man. He was a goodly young man. There was not among them the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than all of the people. That verse just tells us that he was the best looking dude that was in the city. If the people were going to choose a king, hey, they would have chosen Saul because he probably had charisma. The text doesn't say that, but, but no doubt he had charisma. He had, he had great ability. He was good looking. He was taller than everybody else. He, he probably had big muscles. He probably had a great character to begin with. And so God says, hey, Saul will be the next king. And so you, you turn over to 1 Samuel chapter number 28, and you go to the end of Saul's life, and you find that he ends up being a failure. Even though he had all of this great potential, even though he had all of this great things going for him, you, you find Saul at the end of his life fearful, jealous, hateful, envious, and losing his relationship with the Lord. In chapter number 28, he's towards the end of his life. In verse number 3, the Bible says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits, the wizards, and out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shimeam. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gibeor. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, notice this, he was afraid. And his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. That ought to get your attention. At a time when Saul needed to get a hold of God, at a time when Saul was fearful and he was trembling, he prayed and the Lord would not answer him, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and, and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Saul disguised himself. Here is the king. Here is someone that has experienced the blessings of God over his life. And, and now at the end of his life, he's hiding, he's disguising himself. And he puts on other raiment and he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring him up whom I shall name unto thee. We know that he wants to speak to Samuel because he knows Samuel has already died, but, but he wants Samuel to come back and he, because he wants to hear from God. He desperately wants to know what God thinks about what is going on. In verse number 16, then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy? Well, let that sink in for a few moments. Not only is the Lord not going to answer his prayer, but, but, but Samuel says, you know what, not only has God departed, but, but now God has become your enemy. Verse number 17, And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Why did he do that? Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord nor executeth his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. You turn over to chapter number 31. And in chapter number 31, the Philistines are coming against the children of Israel. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and, and fell down slain in Mount Geboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, Abinadab, and Melchimshua, Saul's son. 
And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He started out with great potential. God said, if you'll just obey me, if you'll just keep my covenants, and, and if you'll just keep my commandments, I, I will establish your kingdom forever. But yet at the end of Saul's life, he has taken his own life. You look down in verse number 8, and the Bible says, And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Geboa, and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent it unto the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of the idols among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Asheroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Here was someone that had great potential. He ends up committing suicide. His enemies take his body and put him up in their temple and mock and make fun of him. Even though he was a king, I think you would have to say that Saul's life was a failure. How did he get from being king to taking his own life? In 1 Samuel chapter number 13. In 1 Samuel chapter number 13. Once again, the Philistines are attacking Israel. Verse number 5 tells us, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitudes, they came up and they pitched in Milkmash eastward from Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed and the people did hide themselves in caves and the thickets and rocks and in high places and pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was in Gilead, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgad, and the people were scattered from him. Chapter 10 and verse number 8, Samuel tells Saul, hey, you go and you wait seven days, and at the end of that seven days, I'm going to come, and then we will offer burnt offerings to the Lord. The people are worried because the Philistines are against them. There's a great army that's coming against them, and they're wanting to leave. They're, they're, they're starting to scatter, and Saul begins to think, you know, hey, Samuel said he was going to be here in seven days where we could offer sacrifice to the Lord. It's seven days he is not here. And so notice what he does in verse number 9. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offerings. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. It's really not that big of a deal, is it? He, he's just offering an offering to God. After all, Samuel said, hey, I'll be there in seven days, and Samuel doesn't come, and so Saul is just concerned about his people, and he decides that he is going to offer the burnt offering. Verse number 11, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because, now notice this, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Milkman. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come now upon me and Gilead, and, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. Now notice this, I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. You see, in our society today, when we would read that, we would think, you know, that's really not that big of an offense. But yet, because of that, God says, hey, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. Because you were disobedient. 
When the man of God confronted him, he began to make excuse. He began to want to cover his sin. He began to blame. He said, you know what? I did this because of the people. I forced myself. I made myself do this. Remember what the proverb says? He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. That's what Saul is doing here. Not only did he do it here, but if you would go over to chapter number 15 with me. In chapter number 15, this is the passage where, matter of fact, let's just read it. Verse number 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord hath sent me to anoint thee to be king over this people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. How we laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go smite Amalek and utterly destroy, what's that next word? All that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Samuel gathered the people together and numbered them and tell them. And then the passage goes on and they attacked them. But verse number 9 says, But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen, of the fatlings, of the lambs, and of all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night long. Can I tell you that's one of the hardest parts about pastoring and being in ministry? Samuel had invested everything that he had in the life of Saul. He tried to give him guidance. He spoke for God. He tried to instruct him in the words of God. And now he saw Saul turning his back. And and the Bible said he was so broken that he cried all night. He goes on. Verse number 12, and when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilead. Samuel came to Saul and said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul saying, you know what? I've done everything that God wanted me to do. Verse number 14, and Samuel said, What meaneth this bleeping of the sheep in mine ears and, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? But notice what Saul says. They, talking about them, The people, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Verse number 19. Wherefore then didst thou obey? Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Verse number 21, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the chief of things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilead. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And following with it is this verse, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You see, in this text, Saul never takes responsibility for his sin. He's always saying somebody else. It's it's somebody else's fault. Matter of fact, I have done nothing wrong. Verse number 35. The Bible says, And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made him king over Israel. Then when you read chapter 16 and verse number 14, the Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. 
God says, because you covered your sins, because you cast them off on somebody else, I'm taking the kingdom from you. When we look at his sins, we would, I, I would say, the average person would say, what is the big deal about those two things? Because as we are fixing to look about David, David's sins was far greater than what Saul's sins, weren't they? I mean, after all, David committed adultery. Not only did David commit adultery, but he committed premeditated murder. But yet when we come to the end of both men's life, we see that Saul ultimately was a failure and Paul says this in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 22, that David was a man after God's own heart. What did David do that was so different? We know that David runs from Saul for a number of years before he is anointed king. And God begins to bless him. Matter of fact, if you look in 2 Samuel chapter number 8, we're not going to read it, but you see David begins to list all of the victories that God has given him. The Bible says David smote the Philistines. He smote Moab. He smote Hadazazar. He slew the Syrians. I mean, just over and over again, you see God giving him victory over and over again. God's blessing him, and boy, he, he's got great potential. The hand of God is upon him. And when you come to chapter number 11, verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him and, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbath. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. I remember the first time I heard this quote. Success destroys more people than failure. I, I, when I first heard it, I, before I really began to think about it and contemplate it, I thought, you know, that, that's stupid. But you know, I, I am sure a little bit of that's what's happened to David because he's had all of this success and, and now he doesn't have to go to war. Now he doesn't have to lead his men into war. Now he can stay at home and he can send them into war. And what happens in verse number 2? It, it came to pass on the evening tide that David arose from off of his bed and he walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman and, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? I've heard all kinds of different explanations, but, but the explanation that I believe that is true, that, that it wasn't just a one-time thing. I, I don't think David was up on the rooftop and saw Bathsheba, and then the very next moment he is sending his, his man to get them. I believe there was a progression. Because David was a man that trusted in God and David was a man that had faith in God and, and I'm quite sure that first night that he was up there and, and he saw Bathsheba, I'm quite sure that he turned and his conscience began to bother him. The Spirit of God began to deal with him and he turned away. But the flesh is strong. And there was something inside of him that said, you know, may, I, boy, I, I just need one more look. And so maybe a couple of nights down the road that he got up on his rooftop again and Bathsheba was over there. And instead of immediately turning, he, he stood there and, and he looked for a little while. He felt guilty and he probably said, I, I, don't, I, I don't need to do that. I, I need to stay away from that. But the flesh was strong. And he's up there again and he sees her and, and this time he's weak and, and because he's been contemplating this, the, the flesh is strong and the spirit is weak. And, and so he sends his men, he says, go get Bathsheba and bring her to me. And they get her and they bring her to him and they sleep with one another and she goes home. David thinks, oh, it's no big deal, but in a few weeks word comes that Bathsheba is now pregnant. David is the father of that child. What's David going to do? He thinks, you know, I'll, I'll cover my sin. 
I'll send letters to have Uriah, her husband, come home. And, and Uriah was a faithful soldier. Uriah was faithful to the, to the nation of Israel. And, and you know, David gets him drunk and says, you know, hey, go home and, and sleep with your wife tonight. And Uriah said, all those men, all of my fellow soldiers are on the battlefield. I cannot do that. And he, and he stayed. David tried another night, and that's why I say it's premeditated murder. He tried another night thinking, you know, hey, Uriah, go, go home. And Uriah says, no. David says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. He writes a letter. He seals that letter up with his seals, and he gives it to Uriah, and he says, Uriah, you take this back to your commanding officer, Joab. He takes it back, and Joab opens that letter, and he begins to read that letter, and I'm sure he's shocked when he reads that letter because he says, hey, you take Uriah and you put him in the hottest, most part of the battle and when the battle reaches its intensity, you withdraw from him and you leave him out there. Thus, he is going to be killed. Those sins surely are greater than what Saul did. Saul just disobeyed. David committed murder. What's the difference? There's really two Psalms. We'll only read one. In Psalms chapter number 32. Psalms 51 is another one of those Psalms that David wrote, I believe, in, when he had committed sin. Psalms 32. The Bible said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought of summer. Selah, that selah just means, hey, you need to stop and contemplate and think about what is said. David said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. In my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sins, Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which hath no understanding, whose mouth must be held with the bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to, thy, to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. In 2 Samuel chapter number 12, you don't have to turn there, but God sends a prophet to David just like he sent the prophet Samuel to Saul. You know the story. Nathan tells him about this story, about there was this great feast and there was this guy that had just one little lamb. And the guy that was putting on this feast, he had, all kinds of, he had all kinds of lambs and all kinds of meat. But instead of going to his herd, he goes to this poor man that just had one, and he takes that lamb and he kills it for this feast. David is enraged. He said, that man shall pay fourfold times. And the prophet of God said, hey, you're that man. David didn't make excuse. David said this, I've sinned before the Lord. And then when he writes these Psalms 32 and Psalms 51, he is crying out to the Lord, wash me, forgive me, restore the joy of thy salvation. David's last words are in 1 Kings chapter number 2. And here's what he tells Solomon. Obey the commandments of God. 
Stay true to God so that he'll establish your kingdom. Let me ask you a personal question. When was the last time that you've asked God to forgive you for sin? When was the last time that maybe you was harsh or angry? Or maybe you intentionally hurt somebody because they hurt you. And the Spirit of God convicted you and you stopped right there and said, God, forgive me. 1 John 1 and verse number 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. What's the secret? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh shall obtain mercy. Let's pray. God, we love you tonight. And Lord, I know this is not an enjoyable kind of message to listen to, but it's needful. Because there came a time in Saul's life when God said, I, I'm not going to hear your prayers anymore. I'm not going to bring conviction. And I wonder tonight how many of us that are here experience that conviction when we sin. I wonder if it's been so long that when that conviction comes that we've said, oh, no, God, no, God. No, it's not my fault, God, that God says, okay, I, I'll let you go your way. God, tonight I pray that we'd all be honest with ourselves that we look at our hearts. And God, I pray if there's anything that's standing in the way of having that sweet fellowship with you, God, I pray that tonight we'd confess and we'd forsake. God, I pray that you'd have your will and your way in our invitation tonight. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Would you stand tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed? Martha and Linda are going to play through a verse of invitation. If God's spoken to you, you come.